Way back in 1984, producer Dan Buchanan discovered two men who would go on to become one of the biggest director duos of all time, the Coen brothers. He recognized their talents and helped them to raise the funds to make their feature film debut, Blood Simple. He was an executive producer on the film, which launched them into a long, award-winning career. Horror films are almost always a safe bet at the box office, so for his next film, Buchanan wanted to produce one. Sifting through potential scripts, he noticed one called Ghost Diary. It was written by relative industry newcomer Mark Frost, who at the time had only written an episode of The Six Million Dollar Man and a few episodes of Hill Street Blues. Buchanan wanted a director, so he put an ad in Variety, which was fairly common back then. The ad was simple, Director Wanted for Feature Film. Young director Richard Friedman saw the ad and was interested. He had just finished working on his first film, a crime drama called Death Mask. He also directed some TV shows, like an episode of Stephen King's Golden Tales, and four episodes of Tales from the Dark Side. Friedman was in his early 20s at the time, and jumped at the chance to do another feature. Buchanan met Friedman, and they hit it off almost immediately. Friedman read the script and liked it, but wanted to make some changes. The script was a traditional ghost story, and he thought it would work better as straight-up horror. One weekend in the winter of 1985, the duo were stuck in an apartment during a blizzard. With nothing but free time, they spent the weekend going over the script and deciding the things they wanted to fix or change. They made change after change, molding the film into something completely different from the original script. They wrote down everything they thought would work, no matter how ridiculous, such as ominous pigeons. They also added every possible cliché they could think of under the idea that that would be what horror fans would want. What they ended up with was a script that took the framing of the original Ghost Diary, and filled it with anything they thought would get a rise out of the audience. The new script is about a female pop star who is just getting over some horrible tragedy and falls in love with her therapist. The pop star, along with her son, moves into an old mansion with her new boyfriend, and they discover there's a voodoo curse on the property. At some point, they change the title from Ghost Diary to The Masterson Curse, and finally, to Scared Stiff. One thing Buchanan learned while working on Blood Simple, you want to shoot somewhere traditionally warm in the wintertime. That way the shoot would be much more comfortable. With that, they decided to film in Florida. The problem was they needed to find a house that looked like a mansion on an old southern plantation. They searched all over Florida, but couldn't find anything. Finally, they discovered the only colonial mansion in the entire state on Star Island. The mansion was empty and unused for some time. The lady who lived there died, and the family hadn't done much with it after that. It hadn't been renovated in years, and the walls were painted a horrendously ugly shade of green. They contacted the owner, who rented out the house for $25,000. After some convincing, they were able to get the owner to then invest that $25,000 back into the production. The owner of the mansion had one major request. There was a very old expensive chandelier that he didn't want anything to happen to. So the crew took it down and locked it in a closet for the duration of the shoot. While cleaning up the house, there was a strange vibe they all felt. There were rumors of it being haunted, but they just shrugged them off as local folklore. They didn't have a large budget, so they had to keep things within their means. They hired Friedman's film school teacher, Yuri Denisenko, to be the cinematographer, who also worked on Death Mask. Denisenko previously did work for Troma with Squeeze Play, Q for Larry Cohen, and even shot the short commercials for the Where's Captain Crunch sweepstakes. They hired a student from NYU to be the first AD. Much of the crew were locals from the popular crime drama, Miami Vice. For the visual effects, they hired Tyler Smith, who worked with Friedman on Death Mask. Smith began to work on designing the props in his New Jersey studio, while the director continued with pre-production. For most of the cast, they hired local Florida actors and actresses. They hired David Ramsey to play the evil George Masterson. Tom Calchalakos was hired to play Dr. Young's patient, Michael. At the time, he was also a recurring character on Miami Vice. For the lead actress's son in the film, they hired young actor Josh Siegel. He had just finished his first film, Cease Fire, in 1985. For the two leads, they wanted to get at least one name actor. After some searching, they were able to hire Andrew Stevens to play David Young. Stevens had done a mixture of both TV and movies, and while he wasn't as big a star as they had hoped for, he was a known commodity. He was between jobs at the time, so he flew in from L.A. for the film. One of the main reasons he took the job was because it was in Florida, and he figured it would be an easy shoot. As for the female lead, that was a problem. Since the role required singing, they were hoping to get a singer who could act. They wanted a rock star for the film, or someone currently trending in pop. They reached out to artists like Sheena Easton and Chrissy Hind at The Pretenders, but none of them were interested. Since that was a dead end, 
they switched to looking for actresses who could sing. Still, they had no luck. They found a few who would have been right for the role, but every single one of them turned them down. Things were getting tense. It was getting close to filming, and they still didn't have their leading lady. Finally, just a few days before filming began, Friedman remembered actress Mary Page Keller. He worked with her briefly on the soap opera Another World. He contacted her about the film, and she jumped at the chance because this would be her first movie. She flew into Florida, where she had a very short time to learn her lines. Also, since it was so close to filming, they didn't have time for wardrobe to get her clothes. So all the things she's wearing in the film were her own. Aside from the cast, a big part of the movie was to be the music. They contacted the Barber Brothers, who was really just one guy, Billy Barber. He had just sold a song to Ray Charles and another to the Oak Ridge Boys, so he was in a good spot. They needed him to write a catchy song that would be heard throughout the film. He had a recording studio in Greenwich, Connecticut, where he wrote the song Beat of the Heart. Mary Page Keller came into the studio and recorded the song in one day, with only about two or three takes. She impressively nailed it. Beyond that, Barbara wrote the score for the film, which often would have hints of Beat of the Heart in it. Once they were getting ready to shoot, Smith loaded up his creations and drove them down to Florida. This included the giant Cochise head. He had a storage unit they parked near the mansion that Smith used as his studio. He continued building and designing props throughout the entire shoot. Jerry Macaluso did the creature design. Smith designed the voodoo mask, which became the face of the monster. Ramsey loved being in the monster makeup, even though it took four hours to apply. With everything in place, they began filming. The opening with the voodoo cult was shot in a nearby state park. They picked as isolated a place as they could find, and since they were doing this as cheaply as they could, they didn't bring in a fire marshal. An open fire in a state park? That's something you could not get away with today. One of the few locations that was a set was the attic. In these locations, the tribe was doing a voodoo chant. The director didn't bother to look up any voodoo chants. He just made up a bunch of words for the actors to say. Now came time to implement the ominous pigeons, an idea that probably sounded better on paper. The concept was to include as many pigeons as possible in key moments of the film. Whenever something bad was about to happen, or if a person was getting too close to an area with the voodoo curse, pigeons would show up. They tried as hard as they could to make pigeons scary. They had a pigeon wrangler on set, but as you can imagine, the pigeons made a mess everywhere they, uh, went. For the mental institution, they found a hospital that allowed them to rent out a section. The patients were all extras from Florida. The director gave them this motivation. Just look crazy! The institution was an homage to the Honeymooners. Cramden Psychiatric, after Ralph Cramden. For the haunted sandbox, Smith molded a giant fiberglass bowl which he cut holes in and covered in dirt. Then he had all kinds of wires and contraptions to make the vehicles look like they were moving on their own. The hallway was a set they built in a warehouse near the mansion in Miami Beach. The crew filming in the hallway during the nightmare was the actual film crew, although the director was the actor from the music video. They had both the giant Cochise head and the piano on a dolly that they moved down the hallway. They had numerous Cochise lamps built. The skeletons in the film were real, this was back in the day when you could buy a real skeleton from a medical supply store that was cheaper than a plastic one. As a way to save money, they shot all the period stuff at the same time. That way they kept everyone in costume. For this scene, they had Ramsey in the chair and Stevens just out of frame. They had to do a few takes to sync their moves up. This is a great use of doing something in camera that now they would probably just do it CG. As time went on, bad things started happening. Buchanan started to think the film was cursed. Odd things were happening around the house. Little unusual accidents kept happening that they couldn't explain. The crew was complaining that the house was haunted, and they didn't want to work in it any longer than they had to. Tempers on set were heated, and one day they reached a boiling point. Friedman had to break up a full-on fistfight between an actor and one of the higher-ups in the production. After that, they stayed away from each other in order to finish the movie. The worst incident came later in the film. There was a scene where Josh was going to jump out of the way of a moving car. They assured his parents it would be safe, and they wouldn't need a stunt double. The stunt went wrong, of course, and the car came within inches of hitting Josh. When it smashed into the USA Today box, it broke free and flew across the road. Even though they were shooting far away with a long lens, the box still hit one of the crew in the face, and he had to be rushed to the hospital. Josh's parents were understandably upset. They had a meeting with the producer and director over the incident. They said since he was in harm's way... 
he needed to be paid a stunt fee, which they obliged. The footage of him almost being hit is the footage they used in the film. The vast majority of the film was done with practical effects. They did have some opticals, and even a digital component. This was also one of the first movies to have an Apple II, although they got no money from Apple. Towards the end, Josh breaks a Cochise lamp over Andrew Stevens' head. They tried to explain to him that it was a breakaway vase, and it wouldn't hurt him at all. Still, he was sheepish, which is why when he hits him, he hits him very lightly. They wanted the film to have a big end, where the possessed Dr. Young falls out the window and into the fountain down below. The problem is, the window is over here, and the fountain is over there. They just shot the scene and hoped that no one would notice the doctor falls out a window and lands 10 feet away. When Dr. Young dies, the evil spirit leaves, which is shown by all the pigeons flying away from the house. These were all homing pigeons, so they just flew back to their home. The shoot ran for nine weeks. Now with the shoot over, they went to rehang the chandelier. They opened the closet to find it had been smashed to pieces. No one could explain how it happened. The door was locked and the producer was the only one with the key. They had to send it out to be repaired, and it cost them over $25,000 to fix. As a way to recoup some money, after the shoot, they sold off some of the props. One guy even bought the giant Cochise head. Josh kept one of the Cochise lamps. After filming, they left Florida and moved everything to New York for post. While working on it, they noticed something. The music video they shot early in the film just wasn't right. They brought back Mary Page Keller and the crew to reshoot it on a set in New York. They also shot an additional scene with the director to make him more evil. They then did a few other brief reshoots, like the love scene in the shower. The film was released on October 23rd, 1987, and was a flop. It didn't even make it into the top 12. In some places, it was released under its old title, The Masterson Curse. The movie apparently did better overseas, but that still wasn't enough to save it. The movie had a VHS home video release in 1988, and then a short time later on Laserdisc, but after that, it fell into obscurity. The director and producer were both disappointed in the film, and pretty much disowned it. Buchanan was miserable. Everything that could have gone wrong, did. A child actor was almost killed on set. A crew member almost died. People were fighting. They went over budget. The most valuable item in the house was destroyed, and he had to pay to fix it. Bird crap everywhere. Then to top it all off, they released one of the easiest genres in film to get a return on investment in October, and it fails. With Scared Stiff bombing, that was the last straw, and he quit the industry. Decades went by, and the film was mostly forgotten. Friedman continued directing, with movies like Phantom of the Mall, Eric's Revenge, and Ground Zero. He even directed a few episodes of Baywatch Nights. In 1992, many years after it was finished, he was finally able to release Death Mask. Andrew Stevens returned to television with the hit show Dallas. He later did a ton of low-budget direct-to-video movies like the Night Eyes trilogy and Red-Blooded American Girl. He admitted to never watching Scared Stiff. Josh Siegel starred in one more movie, Coupe de Ville in 1990. Mary Page Keller went on to be very successful, mostly in TV shows like Duet, NYPD Blue, and Pretty Little Liars. Mark Frost wasn't particularly happy with what they did to his script. A few years after Scared Stiff, he worked with director David Lynch and created the insanely popular TV series Twin Peaks. The film was sort of a sore spot for most who worked on it. They had put it all behind them and moved on with their careers. Well over a decade later, in 2004, film historian Robert Ellinger stumbled into one of the last video rental stores that still had VHS tapes. While searching the aisles, he was drawn to Scared Stiff by the eye-catching cover art. He rented it, and while he wasn't too overwhelmed with the movie itself, he loved the music. There was something about the soundtrack that transcended the silliness of the movie. He searched all over, but there wasn't a soundtrack, and the only good version of the song Beat of the Heart was from the home video release. He looked into it further to discover the film itself never made it past Laserdisc. This started a long obsession with Scared Stiff. Over the next few years, he started acquiring everything he could from the film. Test posters, various copies of the VHS from all around the world, and even a Scared Stiff paperweight that Republic Pictures released as a promotional item when the film hit home video. Ellinger was able to get a hold of Beverly Sapphire, the costume designer for the film. She sent him a piece of fabric from the salmon-colored dress worn in the film. 
As time went on, he wanted to see if there were other fans of the movie out there. He ripped Beat of the Heart and uploaded it to YouTube, where he discovered there were indeed other fans who loved both the song and the movie. Ellinger works in the music industry and was able to track down and contact Billy Barber. He explained his love of the song and hoped Barber would have the master tracks. Unfortunately, the music was recorded back in the days of digital audio tapes, and he misplaced the master. He looked for it, but with a ton of tiny tapes, many of which not labeled, he couldn't find it. Not one to give up, Ellinger reached out to producer Dan Bachner. Bachner was shocked to hear someone bringing up Scared Stiff again after all these years. This was something he disowned decades ago and pretty much had forgotten about. Ellinger told him he should re-release the film and perhaps introduce it to a new audience. Right now, numerous companies are restoring old genre films, and this was on many film enthusiasts' lost movie bucket lists. He pointed out all the positives in the film, and Bachner became interested. There was a problem, though. No one knew where the original negatives were. After much digging, they discovered that over the years it went from Republic Pictures to Orion to MGM. The footage had been sold off in various lots over time, and they located it in a bunch of random boxes in a vault in Pittsburgh, where it had remained for 30 years. Beyond the negatives, the boxes were filled with promotional materials that they were never able to use. A gold mine of content for a forgotten property. Bachner contacted Friedman, and they were able to get a restoration of the film off the ground. Arrow Video was interested, and they cleaned up the film to the point of where it actually looks better than it did all the way back in 1987. The image is clear, although sometimes that's a bad thing. Like in this dream scene where Kate gets her throat cut, you can see she just gets some blood smeared on her neck. They reached out to some of the people who worked on the film, and were able to get Josh Siegel, Andrew Stevens, Tyler Smith, Jerry Macaluso, Barry Anderson and Billy Barber to provide some additional background information for the Blu-ray release. Richard Friedman, Dan Buchanan, and Robert Ellinger did a commentary track. While the DAT masters for Beat of the Heart are still missing, the song is now much clearer on the restored video. Billy Barber even did a piano version of the song, which was heard occasionally, but not in its entirety in the film. Josh still owns the Cochise lamp, although he said it's buried somewhere at his mother's house. Ellinger offered to buy it from him should he ever find it. Friedman was young when he made this, and said if he knew then what he knows now, he would have done things much differently. He would have gone for suspense rather than shock, and wouldn't have thrown in every cliché he could think of. After all these years, Friedman and Buchanan have returned to see that Scared Stiff was not as bad as they remembered. While it was a low point at the time, they're both happy now it's being introduced to a new audience, and any old fans can now see the film as it was meant to be seen. As a thank you for setting the restoration in motion, Buchanan gave Ellinger some negatives from the film out of his personal collection. Scared Stiff is definitely unusual. It's slow, even by slow horror movie standards, and it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Who is this curse targeting? Masterson gets cursed, but then he kills his wife and kid. The wife who is trying to help the slaves. Then random things happen, like the handyman who accidentally hangs himself near the beginning of the movie, that no one notices until the end. Even after the police have been to the house. Plus, you have the incompetent detective, the red herrings, and of course... It's not a bad film, but it definitely could have used some help. I do wonder what they would have ended up with if they actually used Frost's script instead of turning it into something else entirely. The Arrow release has breathed some new life into the film. Both Buchanan and Friedman have come to peace with Scared Stiff and can now appreciate it for what it is, as well as poke fun at all the things they did wrong. Ellinger started looking into the restoration of the film in 2013. Here we are in 2019, and the film, much like George Masterson, has risen from the grave. It's funny to think that this film has been located, restored, reunited with its creators, and re-released, all because a guy was looking for a song he heard over a decade ago. It smells kind of funny in here.